as people are coming in, them getting to say, you've changed my family's life and what's next? That is so rewarding to have been a part of people's story and has completely changed my life too. Um, it's just very powerful and I want to have that kind of impact on people. It's just, for me, money is not power. Money is freedom. Money means different things for different people. And uh, to help other people realize their dreams and change families and generations is so cool. I am Christina Suter and this is the Real Estate Breakthrough Show, where we talk about the reality of real estate, the mindset you need in order to face the reality of what it is, and tips and tricks to get you moving forward in investing. I am your host, Christina Suter. And we have Aaron Norris with us at the Property Radar. And we were talking about actually my daughter first, and we were talking about being perfectionistic, <laughs> right? And, and I know it's a weird, top, weird place to start with real estate, but it is what we're talking about. And how do you manage this? Because the purpose of the Real Estate Freedom Breakthrough Show is to talk about how you grow through real estate. How do you make a breakthrough through using the vehicle of real estate? So yeah, it's about financial freedom, but it's also about personal freedom, mm -hmm. right? You know, and you were saying, so you were, so, so repeat the story. You were talking about being a gymnast. Yeah, in New York, I was a professional actor and my, my, my father, Bruce Norris, took me to my very first Broadway show which happened to be Greece featuring Xena, the warrior princess. <laughs> it was, I don't mean to bag on her. She did a fine job. It was just an odd casting choice. <laughs> but I, I looked at, this was before I went to performing arts school. Right. And so I looked on stage and I'm a realist. I look around the room and see who my competitors are. And I knew I was about to get my ass kicked. I was like, <laughs> I got to be that good. Oh my God. And at the time, Footloose was on Broadway. Chicago was on Broadway. It was all these heavy dance shows. Oh, I love and I, had, I was a, a, a medium advanced mover, but right. yeah, I had a lot of work to do. So I decided to go into gymnastics and I had no idea how much I would fall in love with the sport. Mm -hmm. And it was a perfect sport for me because growing up in, I, I didn't play a lot of like sports in high school, but it always stressed me out playing sports because there, there was that team mentality where if you drop the ball, you were a jerk. <laughs> mm -hmm. And gymnastics, the way that I learned it, it was a very individualistic sport. And, but I was very competitive and I progressed in rapid speed. Within one year, I was on the, in the elite group, mm -hmm. going from not knowing how to do a backflip to wow. throwing tricks I never thought possible. I absolutely fell in love and I thrived because it was that individualistic sport. And then surrounding yourself with people that you could watch uh, execute who had had like years and years and years of experience. And I grew the fastest that way. People who don't know gymnastics don't know what you just said, that you went from not knowing a backflip to being in the elite group within a year. <laughs> they have no idea <laughs> they, they what kick ass that is, what you that's, just talked about. That's also how I ruined my body. So <laughs> transferring from a spring floor to metal and wood stages across the United States and on a cruise ship, I was, I was throwing flips on a cruise ship that would also go up and down. <laughs> not a good idea so anyway. that is amazing so i mean that's usually my first question is tell us about your background in real estate so i mean tell us about your background before real estate and and so you know i mean part of your story i know is is you know again we didn't record this piece but like the sense of being humble like i mean you started in gymnastics you were highly competitive you went to broadway you went to new york right multiple Off story walk-ups is one of my favorite ones of your stories so tell us about that the what the, the, having multiple, you're, you lived in a flat where you, there was no elevator. You had to walk up multiple stories. Oh, which one? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, like, see, this is not a stretch. I'm not like, you know, I don't even have to have a good memory for this. Okay. That's not true. There was two places that oh, one, my, the very first place was a hotel that they converted and it was, it was not a nice hotel. The Hotel Belle Claire on 77th and Broadway, I think that's since been renovated. That did have a very scary elevator. <laughs> but yeah, the very last place I lived in Washington Heights, it was a five floor walk up. And um, I usually was in tow with my 50 pound backpack because once you left Washington Heights for the day, you weren't coming back and you had to absolutely have everything you needed for the day. So yeah, I would all, even as an athlete, I'd climb those steps and be winded. <laughs> And that's not including the subway stairs from the A train. Uh, yeah, that's a, I had very strong legs. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> I bet you were a love in lovely shape, Aaron. <laughs> 
thank God I have pictures from that time. I'm like, see, I promise I was in amazing shape. I really was. I really was. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Uh, Okay, so no then you left the five floor walk up to come back to Southern California, right? Mm -hmm. So if I understand the story correctly, so fill us in. Yeah, mom um, got the news that she had bone cancer. So she had had breast cancer for a number of years. And I don't know at the time, I never did Broadway. I was close to three Broadway shows. I was getting really close. I was a union actor performing all over the world. And I was getting a little bit burned out. And I just don't know. It was one of those moments in life. So I, I always pray for green lights and red lights. Just make it be clear. Make Don't be let clear. me struggle. And this was one of those moments in life where it's just like, it's time to go. Yeah. I never thought I would be back in California ever, 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 ever. And I just went, I sold everything pretty quickly, did my last uh, union contract and moved back to California. And the rest is history. My body fell apart. Uh, my first professional acting gig, um, I went down pretty hard. Uh, my second acting gig, I went down even harder, found out I have back arthritis and a torn disc. So my professional career as I knew it with my agent <laughs> in tow uh, was over. Wow. And I got really lucky that I built some other skills in New York City that transferred well, fell into marketing, and I, I didn't even come back to work with my in the family business, the Norris Group. That wasn't even the plan. So I got very lucky, but that's how I ended up back in California. Okay. And uh, I know your mom did eventually pass away. Blessings, blessings on her. I'm, I'm Thank sure you. she's yeah. peaceful now. You know what? Six, six years in stage four. Um, you know, she was a true inspiration. I learned a lot from my mom and dad. I like to say I'm a, I'm a really amazing blend. Um, I learned my humbleness from both of them. I don't take myself too seriously. And there's always room for improvement. That's why my daughter's not as humble. I am not nearly as humble as your dad. I am not. I'm just saying, and I'm probably not nearly as soft spoken as your mother, because I am not soft spoken, <laughs> not in any way, shape, or form. They're, they, you know what? They're just lifelong learners. I, I watched what my 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 mom did during her uh, her cancer battle. I mean, her bookshelf shelves. I'm sorry, library of mm -hmm. information that she was doing fighting for her life uh, determined to uh, be the best of East meets West. Um, you, she never complained. You never heard her. It was very rare to catch her off guard in a moment of sadness about her condition. She always tried to protect us. And uh, I learned a lot from that. And then I watched my father sort of doing the same thing, backing her up, being there for her every step of the way. Not a peep of selfishness, um, just the ultimate servant. It was, it was pretty amazing. You made so, me cry. Like literally, uh, I'm gonna start crying. You know, I I I'm just very blessed. Um I in life, and I know we'll talk about where I'm at now. Um I, I feel like I'm I'm getting to live a third dream. Yeah. Uh, a, a not a different chapter, a completely different book. I, you know, as a professional actor from New York, getting a chance to work in the family business and now as co-owner of the Norris Group and now with property radar. <laughs> Be careful what you write in goals. <laughs> be very specific. And you, Cause you'll get there. And, <laughs> and then you'll be like, oh, is this really what I wished for? Hold on spirit. Is this really, wait a minute, this is what I wished for. Okay, wait a minute, hold on. Okay, so here you are now. Okay, let's just jump. Cause a lot of people know your, your history with being Aaron Norris, you know, Bruce Norris' son, working at the Norris Group. We love you, we adore you, you're fantastic. You've always been supportive of your dad. But now you are, you could say on your own, but you have taken on a whole new position with Property Radar with Sean O'Toole. So let's just jump there. Yeah. Go for it. You want, you want the story of how we got there? Yes, I do actually. Because I, I, mean, I, I can guess at it from having watched you guys at the, at the different, uh, I survived real estate events. So I can guess at it, but tell me. Okay. Well, no, yeah. No, no, I, I, I want to hear, I want to hear the actual, you know, give a little okay. gossip. Yep. A little hey, gossip. It, it's out there. There's no secrets. And okay. um in, I've known Sean. Um, Sean was the most featured guest, Pro Sean O'Toole with Property Radar, first foreclosure ra radar. He's mm -hmm. been on our panel at I Survive Real Estate for, I think, a decade. He's done 10 years. He's the most sought after guest. And what's funny, he's always the most reluctant. Um, he's got an yeah. unusual friendship with my father. They really enjoy each other. Yeah. Total nerds at heart. Yeah. And oh. He always feels like he's the negative guy on the panel, but I'm like, John, you bring such interesting insights and it's just no nonsense. It's data backed. 
they love you. And it's just not the same without you there. And he really brings that real estate perspective. So I've just been a huge fan. And whenever I was up in Northern California, we would try to get together for lunch and lunch. And he he really was always a lending ear, hearing me commiserate sort of about my journey within the Norris group. Um, I think part of it is I, I never wanted to take anything for granted and being sort of, sort of a second generation small business owner, there's that there's that fear that you haven't earned your seat at the table, that you were just handed it to you because you're an heir. And I, I hate that. So I think I always put a lot of extra pressure on myself to go the next step. My dad was so supportive of me in my career as an actor. He would surprise me just in Puerto Rico or in other states. That was their thing. They liked to surprise me when I was performing. He was amazing. And as, as a, a guy who grew up in a very like machismo environment, you know, to have a son that was in the arts is just hilarious. The fact that he was able to be that supportive. So at the Norris Group, I felt like my job all along has been to allow everything to get out of his way to where he could educate and do what he loves. And it's been such a blessing. So in December of last year, I decided to rewrite my goals. I've been using this thing called the Full Focus Planner, and it's been magical for the last two years. Okay. Um, every quarter you have to rewrite your goals and it serves as a reminder of how bad you suck if you don't hit those goals or you're not consistently hitting it out of the park. Yeah. Well, in there, I had decided that it was time for a third hustle. My real estate investments, the Norris Group clearly weren't keeping me busy enough. So I needed okay. like a third route. Yeah. And it was. Sorry, Aaron. I wish I had known. I mean, come on. <laughs> you it, sure seemed busy. <sighs> well, I just. I just want to grow. And I was, I've been really taken aback at how our industry has appreciated my entrance into the technology and the legislative side of our business, looking for unique opportunities in the space that are, is hyper local, something that Main Street will thrive in, but Wall Street won't because they don't care about the local markets. They can't. Yeah. Um, so I wrote these goals down. And then we've been in Florida helping investors do very complicated 1031 exchange transactions. And we are working with a builder that unfortunately, as soon as COVID-19 hit, we ran into a snag and we discovered that they were mismanaging funds, um, that they were backfilling old projects and it just sort of hit um, all, all at once because it was a lag of projects and yeah. the gravy train had to stop. As soon as we found out what was going on, we yeah. traveled to Florida, we fought to get in contact with every single contractor, come to find out, even though we we're using funds control, um, the, f the notice to owners were only being reconciled at the very end of the project where unconditional lien releases were filed only by the contractors that were following Florida law to protect themselves. And it was a fraction of who, it, who should have been doing it. So we basically stood between uh, 22 investors, 38 contractors on, we checked around 60 projects, but we said to all of them, we either get through this together as quickly as possible right now, or the only people that will be making money are the attorneys that you will all have to hire to fight each other on this. Because the minute that the Norris group walks away, all the funds control will be released to all the investors because we can in good faith help assist in this anymore. Mm -hmm. It'll go back to them. Mm -hmm. And each of you 38 contractors will be getting attorneys and having to deal with these 22. It would have been a nightmare. I have never worked so hard in my entire life. <laughs> so it was clear in April that I'm like, you know, I was like, hard money. It's not exactly my passion. I've so enjoyed working with my dad and Sean O'Toole sent me an email. And okay. it was the job description that yeah, we'll get uh, back to, we'll get back to Florida. We really, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get back, back right there with the 22 or 28. Oh, geez. I'll get back to that. Cause that's, that's going to be the story later on. Right. So let's get to this. We'll finish on a tool first. Go ahead. Send me a job description wanting, Hey, do you know anybody that would be good at this? And it's their property radar is about to go national. I've been a longtime fan of him, but a subscriber of property radar as well. I, sure. I do. Me too. Every day. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I raised my hand. I was like, this is the weirdest thing. I've always wanted to work with you. What would you think? And, uh, he and I got on the phone. I was very honest about everything going on. This is what's happening. This is sort of what I liked my future to look like. Um, we're going to correct this. Dad is going to write a very large check. Um, that means the Florida stuff will may or may not continue. It long story short, it is continuing. We've found a new builder, but you know, it, my involvement, what I've been busy with doing 
the most is all of that as far as the research. And now it's not going to take that much. I don't need to be a W-2 employee for the Norris Group. I'm in the background. I'm not needed all the time and I want a challenge. So he basically created a position, a VP of Market Insights for Property Radar. I'll be working with the media. I'll be writing a lot. I am co-host of the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. And he's challenging me, which I really appreciate. I, I consider myself good in between. I'm good at the creative and the data, the left and right brain. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I sort of think I'm a communicator for, the pe for the, both of those people. One of the yeah. things I love doing is making complex things easy to understand yeah. and actionable. So this is like a dream come true. So it's a lot of work, but I'm having a lot of fun. And I would think it's a lot of work, but I also would think it would be challenging. I do not know Sean to be somebody who sits by the wayside. I do not know. I, I feel like, and again, I don't know Sean well, but you know, my take on Sean is that he's always pushing towards the cutting edge, whether it's the cutting edge of what he's doing as far as his programming and his company and his software, or whether it's the cutting edge for himself on being able to be, braver, stronger, mentally stronger, you know, take on that next challenge. I don't know if he stays with Tony Robbins or what he does, but he clearly is constantly pushing his own sense of inner success mm -hmm. as a living, breathing conversation inside of him. So he must be pushing against you the same way. Yeah. And you know, what's great is he doesn't have to push me very much. It's he clearly sets a, a high bar. So I am definitely feeling the heat and a lot of it's my own stress. Like I want every show to be as perfect as possible and everything we write to be very data driven. Um, and Sean is an absolute nerd in the best way possible. That man knows public records like nobody, like the way he talks about it. I mean, there's over 200 fields in property radar to create very hyper localized lists. So whatever niche you want to tackle, you can with property data, mortgage data, and demographic data, you can get as specific as you'd like. <laughs> so the fact that he created each of those fields and know why they're there and the nuance by county and by state, mind-blowing. And not only that, the trends, economic trends and technology trends. So he can talk about the Weimar Republic and an inflation-driven economy, uh, which uh, we'll talk about at your club, uh, and then uh, to Bitcoin and technology and how that's going to impact real estate. I mean, he is very well read. It's very intimidating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I could see how it's very intimidating. I remember the first time I ever saw Sean talk, it was, he was talking about the shadow inventory back in 2010 or 11, right? Back, yeah. back in that time. And he, he, had, he, was at the, he was at Bill Tan's LA Via Club. And mm. I was just like, oh my God. Like, this is a whole area that I hadn't even thought about at the time. And I, I just, I brought that right back to my club as fast as I could. I'm like, oh my God, I just saw this guy. Let me talk about, you know, and I just, and I went home and I researched and dug in and really wanted to figure out what was the shadow inventory stuff that, because I hadn't occurred to me that it was so significant. And, and Sean was the one who, who, you know, showed me a whole nother layer of data research. But I, I know that, and that's not, I mean, the reason why I think you and Sean are a good mix is because like you said, you're the not, you're the space in between the data and like the, you know, the everyday street, you know, the, the everyday investor like me or people who are, you know, just like, you know, we just own, we, you know, I'm just saying like we own some units, we're mom and pop, I'm a mom and pop investor. Let's not be confused. I'm a mom and pop investor. I've owned single families and multi units and I do flips. And, and I, 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 you know, that's it. I don't own 150 units in five different cities, right? I don't have, you know, um, you know, 2,500 doors to my name. Doesn't mean I won't someday, but for right now, I don't have, I don't have 2,500 doors. The most I've ever had is 350 doors to my name. That's the most I've ever had. And then I sold all of that at the top of the market was the market was sliding down. Not that I was that smart. I sold it as you were starting to slide down. I'm just telling you the truth because you know, <laughs> I can't stand on a lie, but I did. And I sold everything. And that's my story, not yours. And we're here for your story. But I think the point is, is that, you know, I think Sean was very lucky to get you because Sean's like, I could, I've invited Sean to come speak at my club many times and it's not really his first love. It's not. Really he not. doesn't he doesn't love it and i it's funny i don't think he realizes how well loved he is by our industry because he's got the street smarts and the data smarts to back it up but he's clearly a little bit more introverted and and that's great so that it that is why i was brought on and because i'm a broker a mortgage broker 
um, a real estate investor. I'm a planned uh, giving guy. Um, I study politics. So I just bring a different flavor. And I love being able to talk to, to Main Street about ideas on how to create value, uh, find unique inventory that nobody else is looking for. So it, it's fun. I mean, my job is literally to help other people make more money. You know what it is? Part of the Florida process with dad is that people come in for an hour consultation with him. They basically show him his portfolio and he basically tells them, yay or nay, this is not right for you. Like, why do you want to do this? You have the best portfolio. Like, don't jack that up. You don't need to. It's inappropriate because of your inventory that you're holding. It's A or, you know, for your age or whatever. But as people are coming in, them getting to say, you've changed my family's life and what's next? That is so rewarding to have been a part of people's story and has completely changed my life too. Um, it's just very powerful and I want to have that kind of impact on people. It's just, for me, money is not power. Money is freedom. Money means different things for different people. And uh, to help other people realize their dreams and change families and generations is so cool. So cool. <laughs> so I want to do a lot more of that. And now I'm not only, I was, I've been using Sean's data in my presentation for years with the iBuyers. That's where I was finding all my iBuyer warning how investors could leverage the iBuyers. And now I get to, I have access to millions of data points across the country for over 3,100 counties. Nerd alert. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. It is. It's, it's fantastic. And I think that, and, I, and again, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Aaron Norris to me has always been the one that is the approachable. You've always been the one that has helped to translate the data. You've always been the one that has managed to take, whether it's your dad or whether it's Sean or whether it's your own passion for data, right, and make it translatable and make it approachable so people can actually implement it and use it, right? Because ultimately, you can talk data to me all day long, but if I don't know how to implement the fricker, it isn't going to help me any. And, and having Sean as a mentor in the data space, I, I, it's a lot. I mean, just all the technology tools that are being thrown my way is pretty funny. All the systems you use internally from Slack. And I, this is exactly why I wanted it. I wanted to, I really wanted to experience the technology realm. And it's, it's fun that it's with Sean. So, Well, I'm looking forward to the day when Property Radar is the face of Aaron Norris. That Aaron Norris is the face of Property <laughs> Radar. That's what I'm looking forward to. All right. Yeah, that's what I want to see. So, um, so for those of us, we've been talking about Property Radar for a while, and we talked about your dad. But what people may not know exactly what Property Radar is, so give us a two-minute, that two-minute, you know, Property Radar is blank. Property Radar is a software as a service. Some in the industry call it as data as a service provider. So any business that uh, is property based, and I say that because I think there's a misnomer that. Property Radar is only for real estate investors, but it's used by realtors, mortgage professional, commercial real estate brokers, but also uh, home services. So pool, pools, contractors, roofs, plumbers, anybody who needs a consistent source of quality leads uses Property Radar. So you can do searches up against property character, characteristics, mortgage data, as well as transfers, uh, distress foreclosure data, as well as demographic data. So over 200 fields and it can get as nerdy and specific as you want. You wanna find absentee owners that lit, live out of the state of California over the age of 65 who's fully depreciated their properties. There's a simple, so it's a very simple search for property radar. They can manage that easily. But, uh, but then the yeah. whole iBuyers thing is the space that you've been specializing in. And are you doing any independent consulting in that? I mean, you could be. No, I, what's really fun is I'll talk about it at your, uh, at your club. That's right. The, the message is basically get to know what your iBuyers are doing and how they're messing up. It, I, I love watching them. There's, it's not being mean and, you know, they have a lot of money. There's a little bit of arrogance. They rely very heavily on technology, but I can't point to their making big money across the board. Um, there's been four in the state of California. Zillow got really hot and heavy into California in 2019. But depending on the iBuyer and the city, um, I, I did a presentation at LA South Rhea with Lisa Hogler um, a, a couple weeks ago. And I, 
and I'll do the same for you. I pull a five mile radius where you typically meet at the club just to explore, see what they're doing. Competitors via fellow flippers, as well as the buyers to see if we can discover any trends. I want to see the average square footage. Is it single family or condo? Does it have as, what's the bedroom and bathroom makeup? You have to make a decision whether you're going to actively compete with them and trying to outbid them good luck because they're paying way more than a sane real estate investor is going to pay. But you have to know that you have to understand why that's happening and not try to keep up with the Joneses because you're not, you'll lose your shorts. <laughs> so you can either decide to work around them or figure out a way to incorporate them into your business. So um, that's how I like to use them. I have real estate investors who go after the stinky ones, uh, whether it's a hoarder house or people with situations that the eye buyers won't touch, but we know that it fits into their buy box and that you can wholesale it to them if you get a, di a big enough discount and you don't have to mess with, mess with rehabbing it. Cool. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause then you can, you know, just fix the problem and then move it on to them. Yeah. So, um, the two questions, the two, I feel like the two juicy questions of my, of, my, uh, of my show is, what's the hardest thing you've faced in real estate and why become a real estate investor? Because I know you have your own real estate investments as well, right? So what's the, what's the hardest thing you've ever had to face in real estate and what did you learn from it? Because real estate can hand you your patootie on a regular basis and, <sighs> and, and you still participate at least i'm still participating you seem to still be participating both personally and professionally mm, yeah right? so I, what's the hardest thing you've had to face in real estate and what did you learn from it i've experienced the hardest part of my business life in the last four months for sure um having your father say this is my second worst business day in my entire life um no, putting your trust in somebody and, and really believing in them, knowing that they were doing. And it was just, and that people are relying on you. That, oh, it, it was layered. The other thing that I was in charge of, we, we realized early on in the Florida process that we had to be completely transparent from the investors to the contractors who didn't know us. They wouldn't even talk to me, by the way. The as soon as we found out what was going on, we flew out there and I started calling the subcontractors that had filed notice to owners. <laughs> and the very first company I called, they're like, I can't talk to you. My contract isn't with you. It's with the builder. I'm like, I need to know right now what you need so I can talk to you today. And they're like, oh, we need this 30 day note. I'm like, I don't have time today. What do I need to do to talk to you today? And we got lucky that the builder has been very active and I, we don't think he, they meant to do it. So, um, they were active and allowed us to have access. And then I called every single one of them. This is our situation right now. I want every single invoice on what you think you're owed because I need to figure out, I didn't trust anybody. So I'm a very trusting person. That's another thing that really sort of hurt my soul is being put in a situation where I had zero <laughs> transparency and I had to get there. And knowing that if I wasn't perceived as being transparent and honest, the subcontractors could lie. I knew that they had other projects where they were probably going to lose absolutely everything that I had zero control over. So being expedient, transparent, kind, <laughs> um, and working 15 hours a day. And I touched over 10,000 pieces of paper. Um, my, and it wasn't just me. We had an entire team. Uh, two and a half weeks to do a full audit on 60 plus properties on 38 contractors working on each of those. I have this huge 2,400 uh, field Excel table where every field could have 10 to 30 data points that went into that one field um, and the conversations and the back and forth emails. It was so intense. It is a good thing. The Norris group was organized and we have the amazing team that we have. Um, our investors because they trusted us. I had to send out emails, about 100 emails every day with an update to the contractors telling them exactly where we had gotten what we needed um, and then followed up to the investors saying, this is what we accomplished today on your behalf. Thank you for your patience. Without that trust from people who didn't even know us, the fact that we stepped in, the contractors start to trust us. The fact that 38 contractors helped us through the process is crazy. You want to you know my, one of my favorite stories is sure. COVID-19 in early May, we had to have a meeting with the contractors where we had finally finished the audit and we were telling everybody how bad it was. 
the uh, the the hotel that we were working out. You'll you'll appreciate this because you do events with the same hotel. And so we're lining everything up, and there's social distancing. It's our very first event post COVID. I'm like, I feel like I need to disclose something, and I don't know how to tell you this. I was like, Do you know what meeting is happening today in here? They're like, No. I'm all. There's a lot of people about going to learn how much money they're going to lose, and um, I know Florida is a right to carry state, and somebody might get their ass kicked tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and the look on the team's face was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm just serious. I just feel like I should disclose it. It is. It's a right to carry state. It's true. <laughs> I'm like, I'm on the kick of being really transparent and honest. <laughs> uh, they appreciated. And sure enough, wouldn't you know, one of the contractors checking in, he let me know that he was packing. <laughs> right. Just letting you know that, nice. uh, you know, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I've been in Florida. I've been, I learned to bowl really well in Florida. I lived three months in Florida and I learned how to bowl really well. And, and I did learn how I did also learn about guns in Florida. That was my first true exposure to firing and firearms was in Florida. So yes, you're right. I'd forgotten that that is a culture in the state. So I, just, uh, I mean, that's, you're right. That's quite a story. It is. Uh, it was, that was just, there's very sweet moments. Um, oddly enough, one of the contractors who was owed the most money was instrumental in getting one of the uh, contractors who had only been in business one year. And this really, it really made me sad. Um, and he was sad because he got them in the business and they were one of the ones not filing the notice to owners and were the most, one of the most exposed. And just everybody talks. You have to understand, this is not how we wanted to build our brand in Florida, but as of now, we're okay because yeah. we fought really hard. And what's incredibly sweet, a side effect by working that hard and fighting so hard for these contractors, because they're small businesses. We support small businesses. It, it was really upsetting. Yeah. Is they're behind the scenes doing things for us that we find out about later. So as an example, we're working with this new builder and I told the new builder, you're overpaying for that. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen every invoice. So I know you're <laughs> overpaying for that. And if possible, I want to fight for these small businesses to get as much business as possible that helped us through this. Right. So I, I forwarded him the contact and without me knowing he called them and the contractor basically said, I really like the Norris group. Let's work together to figure out how to save them some more money. Come on, come on. It's, it's good stuff. Uh, it's good stuff. It's, it's what good stuff creates is good stuff. I mean, you know, well, I don't mean to pay, it's but that it's extremely humbling. I'm knocking on wood every day. Okay. Um, it's just, you, I really thought we had developed systems needed to protect people. Yeah. Um, I mean, if anybody I, has, I mean, I've been to your, to your guys' boot camp and I've watched your brother go through the systems, the checklist you guys have before you flip a house and what's necessary to be able to figure out what you're going to put in that house and what those costs are. And I've seen that list and it's really intimidating. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. So it's, it is startling that a company that is as well organized and as thoughtful as you guys are can run into this kind of, you know, this kind of trouble, even with the funds control that you'd run into this kind of trouble. That's, yeah. And it was just, we had funds control light. It wasn't, uh, you know, true funds control is where they're writing checks directly to the subcontractors. But and here's so, the thing. if they've you, got want, the, you don't want to do that. You don't want to be in that. The it, Norris well, Group doesn't want to be writing, oh. you know, checks independently to 38 contractors. <laughs> you are now. But you didn't want now. to at the time. No. It's but not we an attractive. We you know? really understand the process now. And you know what? You, you live and learn. And this was a very expensive, painful mistake. I think we've figured out a, a better way. Um, uh, we've discovered, uh, uh, in Florida, their title companies, they don't call it escrow, they call it closings and, um, their attorneys. So yeah. the title attorney wants to do funds control. They understand all the systems that we're using and they're willing to cut the checks because oh, of the systems that we're using okay. every week. So okay. instead of being on a random draw schedule, these right. are really going to be clipping along paid weekly and we've, nice. we've made a better process. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I like it. Okay. So what did Aaron Norris learn from this? Not what did, not what did your dad learn? Not what the Norris group learned. What did Aaron Norris learn from this? And <laughs> um, then I'll share with you something I've learned recently. 
being humble, number one. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite calls was to my brother. My brother and I are very opposite ends of the spectrum. He's yeah. super introverted, really analytic, has a construction background, and I'm very extroverted, very trusting. He's studying to be an attorney right now, and he's very argumentative and stubborn, and I'm just very <laughs> friendly, and I just want to love and trust he everybody. Did, he didn't need it. He was already that way. He didn't right. need to become an attorney to become that way even more. I'm just saying. So God I bless your brother, but please. I'll call him and he'll start beating me up with how bad it is. I'm like, listen, I don't have time. I'm viewing, I'm videotaping every single project right now, documenting absolutely everything. I want you to tell me what I don't know. Tell me what I don't know what to ask because I'm too stupid. Right, right. There's no such thing as a stupid question. And you better start surrounding yourself with people who challenge you. Don't assume you know everything. There's no room to be arrogant in this business. And if you're not learning, you're certainly, you're losing. <laughs> Just, you're not learning, you're losing. Oh, I love it. If you're yeah, not learning, you're so losing. I just, uh, it's just been very humbling and I want to continue to learn. I will be forever grateful for this opportunity to learn and that we got out of it in a way that, in the manner that we did. Okay. So you learned that humble works. You learned that integrity works. Transparency. Transparency um, works. Ask a lot of questions. And what is difficult is when you don't know if you're not exposing yourself to a lot of different stuff, you just don't know the questions to ask. Just right. by going through this process, I learned so many things I never would have had the opportunity to learn because then I'm, I'm not a general contractor. Right. I'm not a builder. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. I just had, a, I just had my uh, survey company come back for a third time to, to stake where the fence was supposed to go. And the guy sent me a text saying, is this all you need? Because I don't want to come back again. <laughs> I don't want to keep jerk. And I said, look, I'm asking as they become aware. And his text back was, was look, I, I'll do what you want me to do, but I don't want to keep charging you money. <laughs> he was like, just tell me everything you need this time, lady. Don't make me come back again. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm not usually so hands-on in the construction piece, right? Normally, I'm more the financier. I'm more the background. I'm not usually the, you know, the on-site project manager. And so I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't. Of course, it would make perfect sense that when we had you out there, we should have you stake the fence while you're there rather than, have, you know, the, you know, okay, so, so you said that to see all of that, you, you opened a little window here and I'm going to, I'm going to walk into it for a minute and then I'll, I will ask you about your financial freedom. You said to see all of that sense of, of overwhelm is what I'm going to call it, right? Because we're going to assume that it was more overwhelm than an intentional slight on their part, right? It was almost breaking to your soul. And what, what about that? Um, it was knowing that every invoice I was touching was somebody's livelihood mm. and that I'm detail oriented to a point, but every single of those 10,000 pledges pieces of paper and even far more data points mattered. And then I had to get it right. And here's the other difficult thing about it. Everything was a moving target. Nothing stopped. Right. There were things that were yeah. in motion that I couldn't right. stop. Right. And so you were dealing with a lot of ambiguity. And I never got numbers from anybody that I did not create. And I was not, <laughs> I wasn't given full access to their financials ever. Um, I almost didn't want to in some respects, because as soon as you go down that route, if we have to start hiring CPAs, attorneys, yeah. you're uh, just a lot of things. Right. Yeah. So that was really funny to have attorneys go, we've never seen anything like this or <laughs> My favorite is like, we don't have time to do this. I'm like, I'll handle it. I, I was doing attorney work. Yeah. And yeah. figuring out technology to merge, merge things. I don't think they knew what happened. The whirlwind that is the Norris group. We <laughs> willed it to happen. I have an amazing team um, that just helped me work some very long hours. But I thought I was going to have a heart attack for a good couple months. Um, yeah. 15 hour days under really high stress. Um, I would be in tears on the phone with some of these small businesses because they were so angry and upset and they were just emotional and they felt, I think it was sweet because they felt safe enough to do that with me and it was heartbreaking. And the fact that at the end of it, they say that they love you. <laughs> means you did it right. <sighs> means you did it right. Means you stayed in hope, integrity no. and you walked the path and you did it right. Welcome to real estate. For anybody I, who's listening to this, welcome to the reality of real estate and doing it right. Just saying. And I, and I, I'm afraid to even talk about it because you're never fully out of the woods. Things are still in progress yeah. and you just never can assume that you're completely protected. I think two good questions that I've learned to be a little bit more astute to is how does it work? 
And why do you ask? <laughs> right. How is it? I like that. Questions couched in like, um, uh, I'll give a really specific example. One of the, the ways that we found out the builder, and we really didn't think it was a matter of stealing money. It was just misquoting bids. And one of the specialties that we didn't fully appreciate in Florida is infill dirt to be up to Florida building code that you have okay. to bring on site to raise it to flood level, base flood elevation stuff. Yeah. Um, and then site clearing. You go to some of these sites in Florida and it's front to back palm trees. And you're like, I, I don't even know how that's possible. And then two days later, you come back and it's clear. Yeah. Come to find out, they charge you by truckload and by weight. Yes. So when I had the builder come to me and say, hey, we've got this project that we're in, it took a little bit more money. And I was like, you know what? It's up to you. You created an average that you thought you were going to nail. Some you'd be over, some you'd be un under, but on average to keep things speedy, if you go back to the investor, people are going to start questioning your numbers. And what I should have said is, why do you ask? Why, why do you ask? <laughs> by how, what, do, what do you mean specifically by this statement? <laughs> Give me and more details. It, and how does it work? <laughs> you know, so by being a little bit more curious, yeah. um, I would have been the wiser. So when you give IQ tests, I study because, of course, I have a master's in psychology, right? So one of the things I did in my internships was give IQ tests. So in, when you give an IQ test, the only question you're allowed to ask is, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. I, I, what about how does that make you feel? <laughs> No, this was, this was giving IQ tests. You don't get to talk about how that makes you feel. That's clinical psychology when you're sitting okay. in front of another student and you're okay. pretending to have an issue which doesn't work at all, but that's a whole other story for a totally different day. But when you're giving an IQ test and you're not allowed to influence the subject, then you're supposed to simply say, tell me more. I can't tell you how helpful that is, but I think your questions are probably even more powerful, which is, and why are you asking this? <laughs> like, this sounds strange. There must be some reason behind. Why are you asking this? Tell and me it's, more. It's a very powerful one too. Why are you asking this? And how does that work? And how does like, that why work? not? Yeah, if anything, they'll just think you're really interested yeah. and really care about why. Yeah. Yeah. About okay. them and what they do. What they they do. get their stuff off a little bit. Okay, so let's get to the last question. So right. financial freedom. So you've just been through one of the most grueling processes I think people can face in real estate. You had a sincere, um, I would call it a fail, but it's not a fail because you guys didn't let it fail. It's okay. It totally counts as a fail. <laughs> okay. You guys had a sincere fail. You guys had a sincere fail, that, which like kicked your ass, which yeah. you guys then had to straighten out, right? That is real estate. Okay. That happens. It seems to happen about once every decade if to a real estate investor. At that point, you can either choose to keep going or you can turn tail and say, I'm done. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have my ass kicked like this again. So excuse me for the bad language for, you know, <laughs> but I'm just saying, right. Yeah. It's, it's the reality of it. So, but you're still an investor. Mm -hmm. So why are you still an investor? You know, I, I never, I have retirement accounts cause I've worked at the Norris group as a W2. We had the SEP IRA. So I've been working away on that. Um, uh, from my professional acting days, when I turned 65, I got a random letter a couple years ago and I started laughing. My defined benefit program, I forgot I even had. When I retire, I will make a whopping $165 a week, a, a month. Ooh, a month. I was, was going to say a week. That's a lot. $165 a month. That's about right. That's about right. So, I'm looking at the quality of life that I want uh, as I retire and mm -hmm. that's rentals. And the John Shaw book, and I, for, I need to learn the name. Uh, about, uh, I was really stressed out for a really long time until I read his book uh, and it just, it, it it's hit not, me. Yeah, go ahead. John it, Schaub. It, uh, John Schaub. John the Schaub. one where you buy one house a year for 10 years, uh, you pay them off and you're done. That's right. I was like, is that it? That's it. That's all I need? That's it. That is it. I tell people that all the time when they want to get super fancy with real estate. I'm like, no, no, no. Don't get confused. <laughs> like, let's be clear here. Yeah. And then it's just, you know, I, looking at what I want my retirement to look like and, and to be challenged, real estate provides so many avenues for creativity and data and the people I get to work with. I, I never would have thought I would have ended up in real estate and I really learned to love it. Okay. And your rentals are in the background. I oddly enough, I, I should have, I shouldn't say this. I love being a landlord. That's why I have property managers now. <laughs> Yes. I think it's all my experience in New York with slumlords. Literally, yeah. God bless the property managers. We should pray for them. Seriously, on a regular basis, they work really, really hard 
with a lot of different personality types. I'm just saying. It's so funny. I, I have a lot of tenants that have been with me since I first started real estate investing. They've never left. And part of my strategy is never to absolutely maximize every dollar that I can squeeze out of them. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. And my one tenant that needed help during COVID-19, um, the, the property manager called me and she's like, listen, she just wants to know if she can have $150 off of my, yes. She's like, really? I'm like, yes. Because right now in this moment in history, if you can, you should. And she's like, oh, okay. And then I started talking about other resources like 211 and stuff like that. And she's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I can discount my payment. I didn't ask you to discount your property management fee. And she's like, well, you're just a real humanitarian. I was like, <laughs> and it's just, after my experience in New York with the, some of the slumlords and the situations I found myself in, right. shelter is just such one of those basic needs that we as real estate investors have a chance to stabilize families' lives, provide, you know, quality shelter at a reasonable price. I just want that for people. Yeah. Uh, so I just really love what I do. I think the most simple and powerful statement you said is if you can, you should at this time. Yeah. God That's don't really like ugly. As my friend used to say on the cruise ship, God sorry, don't like, ugly. God don't God. like ugly. God don't like ugly. <laughs> I'm a big believer in karma. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a great believer in karma too. I'm a huge believer in karma. I have a friend of mine who we were talking about karma and I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that I'm such a believer in karma, totally off the subject and probably this will get cut out of the show, but I am such a believer in karma that I actually believe karma is instantaneous. I do not, I really do believe that it travels with you instantaneously, that you know someplace in your being, you have done something wrong. And when you come back to your heart or you come back to God, it's going to be waiting for you. I agree. Right there. And, you know, the property manager, she, she was giving me a little bit of a hard time because she was like, you know, you're, you're several hundred dollars below market rent. I'm like, but here I am eight years later with the same tenant where as soon as she moves out, I know I'm going to have to do A, B, and C, lose a month of rent and put in, you know, this much money. I was like, so am, am I wrong? <laughs> I'm like, I understand you're wanting to maximize. My goal is just to be slightly under. So now with COVID-19, I now have the ability to stay exactly where I'm at. My tenant has been loyal. I, I enjoy her. I've supported her family over, you know, the last eight years that I've owned this particular condo. I believe people pay attention to that. And if they have to make choices, they will make that consider, consider those sacrifices that you've made knowing that you've benefited them. So. I absolutely, you do, you know, David Tilney, of course, of course. right? So this John Schaub's book, Own 10 Houses Plus One, I call it the 10 plus one plan. I think it's incredibly helpful. Anybody, I wish I could remember John Schaub's book. I don't think it's voted off real estate. Don't get voted off real estate island. I don't think that's the name of it, but that's another book. Um, and then the David Tilney system where you take really good care of your tenants. You treat them as, you, you indoctrinate them to the concept that they have a stake in the property they're standing in and they can make choices. Mm -hmm. And it indoctrinates them to stay and it encourages them to take ownership over where they are, which is always a better tenant. And it's not about maximizing rent, it's about maximizing their sense of ownership so that your property stays stable and valuable over a long period of time. Yep, agree. Right? And so, so your plan, is, so you're the 10 plus one guy. You're gonna be the 10 plus one plan guy, that's your plan. I've, I'm done it. I just have to pay them all off. You have to pay them all off. See? And it's addictive. And For those who have not started in the business, I promise you, when you take down your first one, it's, you're like, that's it? Okay. I think I can do that. <laughs> and it gets very repetitive. And you're like, <laughs> all right. My worst regret is I didn't start sooner because I was nervous or I didn't, I didn't find myself in the business and in the niche that I thrived in. I wasn't processing the business that way. That's why we came up at the Norris Group with the um, investor roadmap, where I would sit one-on-one -on -one with people for half an hour and just sort of discover, tell me a little bit about yourself and let me throw some ideas at you mm -hmm. that I think you'll really thrive and just take it and run with. Yeah, I call it the investor profile and the strategic plan. I know we do something similar, yep. right? Which is good because you really can't help an investor if you don't have their roadmap. Yep. You, you, you can't, you're, you're, you're making suggestions into a vacuum that may or may not be meaningful or make any change in their life. So you have to understand where they're going 
in order to make any, to say anything that's going to be valuable to them. If you're a complete introvert and they show up to one of your meetings and somebody's talking about door knocking, you know, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> like that sounds like the worst life ever. <laughs> it is. Actually, I don't even want to door knock and I'm an extrovert. Door knock. Yeah, but door there are knock. people that thrive doing that and it cracks me up. And I think that's what's fun about this business. There's so many ways to slice and dice. It's just finding your niche and then realizing the niche exists and yeah. just doing one thing, starting small. Do one thing. Yeah. I don't know, Aaron, you're a couple years younger than I am, if not a good decade younger than I am. So I think you probably are doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'm 51. Are you really? Yes. Well, congratulations on your face because I have no much. idea. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of makeup helps really well. It covers the age spots really nicely. I turned 43 this year. So See, yeah. I told you I'm almost a decade older than you. I'm not quite your senior though. I just don't quite, I don't consider myself your senior. Oh, yes, you've been, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely much more of your cohort. But, uh, but I, I, I'm sorry, I was trying to tease you and it was a bad tease, I guess. So there you go. But um, we've been on for an hour. So okay. it is time for people to know that if they want to know more about Property Radar, mm -hmm. or if they want to know about the iBuyer market and what Aaron Norris has to say about that, or if they want to know about more, know more about the Norris Group, which is a, another company you're still involved with, mm -hmm. this is your opportunity to tell people about how they can get a hold of you. Very cool. Well, first of all, hopefully you, I, this will probably air a little bit after because when will. we're taping this tomorrow yes. is when I'm speaking and I will be creating some iBuyer maps that everybody even that listening to this will have access to. It's actually Yay. in the Property Radar community. So Good. if you type in Property Radar community in Google, you'll find it. It's, um, but there'll be specific links to where if you're a subscriber to Property Radar, you will click it and I have done a search for you so we, you can see what the iBuyers have been buying in the state of California uh -huh. for 365 days. And it's yeah. constantly being updated. And then I show you what they've been selling for the last 90 days because I'm that nerd. So if you're not a subscriber, there's a free three-day trial if you sign up and then you can play with the maps. It's super nerdy, but it's fun. So don't worry about it. I love it. The Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, it's only two months old, but it's an hour interview every uh, week. And on Thursdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, you can tune, uh, tune into YouTube and chat with me. We basically okay. air it and we live chat and it's more nerdiness. So there you go. Sounds great. I, uh, uh, the Norris Group .com. Norris Group. Mm -hmm. um, Dad is still kicking. He has moved to Florida full time. <laughs> Yes. We are not slowing down. We are still lending yes. uh, in Florida and California. We're still building a lot in Florida, um, but he's still doing the radio show for the Norris Group. So um, please continue. Who, who's him. getting his his um, I'm gonna sound horrible? Who's getting his equipment right so that he's actually hooked up correctly? I will be. Uh, yes, uh, Joey Romero in our office. Is Joey, incredible. Of course, Joe. Uh, and he's the one organizing and will actually be sitting in as a third seater on all the shows now. So, um, which I love. Joey has been in, in the office for three years now. He's got all his licenses and he asks really great questions. Um, and he's got a great sense of humor. So it's a good way to incorporate Joey into the mix. So he's coordinating all that for the real estate podcast. Um, and, you know, just tune in to the, the Norris Group podcast and you can always contact the Norris Group if you need help. Okay, and if anybody wants to get a hold of Aaron Norris, mm. right, uh, Mr. Aaron Norris himself, the great, they <laughs> want to get a hold of Aaron Norris or they want to have you come speak, how do they get a hold of you? If you just, you can email me at Aaron at propertyradar.com. Okay. Um, or if you just really feel like you need to call me, um, you could always call the Norris Group office and this is where I'm parked. I'm not, I'm not relocating to Truckee. I'm actually working remote. So oh, okay. holding down the fort in SoCal. All right. Okay. Super cool. So I can call the Norris group.com. Aaron, I adore you, as you know, and I so appreciate you and the, the space that you, the, the character and the humility you stand for in our field, Thank which you. I think is your story. Your Florida story is a really good example of that. And a really good, like, you know, if you want to be a real estate investor, there will be, or potentially could be a time where this is what you face. I know I have faced my version of it myself. And, uh, Nobody's asked me about that yet, thank God, because I'm not sure I'm ready to share. Ah. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but this is what it can be, and yet we can be whole and complete people of good character, good integrity, and pay it forward 
while we're facing some of the hardest experiences I think investors face. And so never, never let a good crisis go to waste. You learn a yeah. lot about yourself and you learn a lot about the team that you surround yourself with. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very proud of how we handled it. So just look forward to those opportunities to show you yourself who you really are. <laughs> I think I'll keep praying for the red and green light. I'm really good with that. <laughs> I, like I actually, I like that. I will keep praying for the red and green light. You tell me, Grace, where am I supposed to go? And I'll do my work. That's where I want to show up. Yeah, please don't give me a meh. Yeah, you know, <laughs> thinking about like, you know, like, oh, I need action here. I need to, you know. Thank you, Aaron Norris. We appreciate you. you. I adore you. Thank you so much for listening to the Real Estate Breakthrough Show. I am Christina Suter, your host, and tune in next week for more information.